Don Callahan is a Park Davis retiree and was Director of Engineering at the Park Davis facility here in Rochester, Michigan. Let's welcome Don Callahan. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Can you hear me okay? Oh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, my wife went for a hearing test one day and they said, are you here for a hearing test? I said, you should have said what? <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to uh, first of all tell you that uh, I'm an engineer with a passion for history and not a medical professional and I'm not an expert on pharmaceuticals. Uh, I learned a lot when I worked for Park Davis uh, and uh, probably enough to be dangerous, uh, but, uh, but certainly not enough to really be a true expert. So, uh, I, and uh, the other thing too I wanna say, although we're gonna see a lot of parallels between what I'm talking about tonight and COVID-19, I really do not wanna discuss COVID-19. It just has too many different uh, avenues and perspectives, so uh, we won't talk about that tonight. Uh, I thought there's probably some people here that are not familiar with Park Davis and uh, uh, actually the company started in the mid-1800s, 1862 to be sure. Uh, Samuel Duffield had a drugstore in Detroit and on the corner of Woodward and Gratiot. And uh, one of the things he realized was that there were a lot of things that he filled prescriptions for on a continual basis. And so he said to himself, why don't I pre-prepare those things and uh, you know, sell them in quantities? And uh, so that was what he did. Well, that was so success successful that pretty soon uh, he had to branch out and uh, uh, start to expand things, but he also needed uh, partners. He needed people that uh, could help him. And the first of those was uh, Hervey C. Park. And uh, Park was a shrewd businessman and uh, knew how to uh, promote the business and how to manage it. And uh, so the, the business still faced stiff competition from competitors and along comes uh, George S. Davis. And, and George was sort of the marketing guy, the smooth talker, the, the guy that could sell uh, refrigerators to Eskimos. And he joined the ranks in uh, 1867, so then there was three partners. And along the way, in 1871, Dr. Duffield decided to leave the company, and, and then it became Park Davis. Uh, they had a manufacturing facility near the drugstore, uh, and they had introduced new products to uh, meet demand. Some of those were biologicals. And biologicals are any substance or serum or vaccine derived from animal products. And uh, so there were Park, Park Davis had quite a few of those. So the, again, they had to expand and they ended up at Joseph Campo at the river. And uh, if you were to go down there today, it's uh, known as uh, Stroh River Place and Talon Center. And it's right along the river walk uh, across from the, uh, I guess that would be the western tip of Belle Isle. I'm never sure which direction the river is running down there, but. Uh, uh, anyway, they um, eventually they had so many animals down there because they were producing different kinds of vaccines and animal products that they had to find a way to uh, have a place where there was animals. The city of Detroit didn't really loan itself to that and so uh, they ended up with uh, 340 acres in Avon Township in 1907 and they began to locate, relocate animals and facilities there and eventually the site comprised more than 700 acres. Um, the property went all the way to Dequinder on both sides of Parkdale Road. So, uh, so anyway, a small portion of that land was occupied by barns and other buildings, and the remainder was used to grow animal feed and botanicals for other medications. And here are some of the things that you see, digitalis to make heart medications, and you all see that, see that word cannabis. Of course, we all know what that means today. And so Park Davis was ahead of its time. Uh, I don't know that they were selling anything that anybody smoked, but uh, <laughs> they were selling these, these other products. Uh, it wasn't until 1937 that the Marijuana Tax Act passed and marijuana became criminalized at that point. Um, let's see, did I get ahead of myself here? Okay, no, I guess I didn't, okay. 
Uh, one of the other things that I wanted to show here was uh, the different owners of the property over the years. And you see there Park Davis up until 1970, and then uh, from 70 to 98, uh, it was the Warner Lambert Company. Now Park Davis' name was still on everything. Uh, once Park Davis merged with Warner Lambert, they took all of their pharmaceutical products and put them under the Park Davis name. It was interesting too, they used to wonder who took over who because uh, one of the guys that was one of our executive officers, uh, Joe Williams, went on to become the chairman of the board of Warner Lambert Company, uh, uh, CEO and chairman of the board. Well then in uh, 2007, the company got sold to JHP Pharmaceuticals. And then in 2014 to Par Pharma Pharmaceuticals. And then in 2015, uh, Par was acquired by Indo International PLC. So that's what we have there today. This uh, aerial view, this is a current aerial view just from today. Well, not from today, but from, I copied it today from uh, uh, Google, uh, uh, one of their satellite views. And the reason I wanted to show you this is there's still a few remnants of old Park Davis, even on the current site. These were barns uh, at one time, and uh, They've been thoroughly modernized inside. Of course, I haven't seen them in 20 years, but uh, they were modernized at that point. And I'm sure they're even, uh, they've even changed some since I was there. But, so there's still a little bit of old Park Davis on the property. The way I got interested in smallpox, uh, during my last years, I retired in 2000. And uh, it was an early retirement. Uh, and, uh, at any, way, at any rate, we were, had been asked to bid by the government on 10 million doses of smallpox vaccine, and uh, we went through that exercise. We, we had a partner. Uh, we were not going to make the vaccine. It was going to be made uh, using cell culture, which is a modern process that doesn't use any animals, uh, and uh, it's much more sanitary, reproducible, many thing, good things to say about it. So uh, anyway, I worked on that project, and then in the course of that, I started look, reading things about smallpox. Uh, the other interesting thing about this project, whoever was successful had to have these 10 million doses warehouse somewhere where they could deliver them in 72 hours. Now the problem was they had to be refrigerated, but there was a whole kit involved that included a, a vial of 100 doses, 100 needles, 100 um, alcohol swabs, 100 Band-Aid type coverings. And this all had to be put together after the uh, material came out of the, of the refrigerator. So it required a facility, first of all, close to an airport and a lot of people available on call to do this. Well, we didn't get the bid, so we never really got to uh, figure that out. But, uh, and, and I don't know if the company that did get the bid exactly what happened with them, but. When we talk about smallpox, this is kind of a synopsis of what Pat read to you there uh, about the things that we're going to discuss tonight uh, until midnight. Uh, and uh, he already summarized it, so I will uh, go on that one pretty quickly. The first thing we can say about smallpox, it was a very deadly disease caused by the very Ola virus. And uh, this diagram shows that a billion people died from tuberculosis over the ages. For smallpox, that was 500 million. And smallpox, cowpox, and monkeypox are all members of the same uh, family of uh, viruses. They're called orthopox viruses. Smallpox had a mortality rate in the more settled or civilized world of 30% but it was 80% in indigenous people. So you can see why the people in the Indians of South America and North America were pretty devastated by the coming of uh, people from Europe. In the 17th century, smallpox killed 400,000 people every year. And in the 20th century, and remember now, we almost eradicated it pretty much in the middle, a little over the middle of the 20th century, but in the 20th century, 200 million people worldwide died from smallpox. So if we had not 
come up with a vaccine, it would have surpassed tuberculosis. Uh, this is a kind of a what is smallpox. I, I chose the least offensive picture I could find because boy, there's some out there that are really disgusting. This is bad enough. But one of its symptoms are these pus-filled pus -filled blisters called pustules. And I said, and then some. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the rest of the, uh, of the other symptoms in a few minutes. So our knowledge of smallpox really dates back to 910 AD. Uh, Racy's was one of the first persons to uh, observe smallpox and actually uh, document it. It was around much before then, but, uh, and the other thing about Racy's treatise on smallpox, it was translated eventually into English, well, first into Greek and Latin, and then it came to Europe and then got translated into English. So, so early on, people in Europe knew about smallpox, maybe even before they started to encounter it on a large scale. But we do know that it's been around for many, many years. Uh, this is the mummy of Ramesses V from 1157 BCE. And uh, I got a closer up here. You can see the pock marks on his sunken cheek there. from small, And we believe it to be smallpox. Nobody can tell 100%, but it's, it more than likely is. And what are the symptoms? Well, rather than pulling up a list of symptoms, I'd like to read you a little passage here from a book called The Fever of 1721. It's an excellent book. Uh, not only does it talk about the smallpox epidemic in Boston in 1721, but science at the time and the politics at the time. So I highly recommend this book to you uh, if you get an opportunity. Uh, before I actually read the part of the book I want to, I want to give you a, a little bit of background information. Now, these are not real images of the actual people and ship that I'm talking about, but uh, in the fall of 1720, there was a merchant ship captain who was a 38-year-old Bostonian by the name of John Gore. And he was sailing from uh, Bridgehampton in England to Boston. It was about a two-month journey. A few months out of port, he discovered that one of his crew members had smallpox. And um, by the time they hit the midpoint of their voyage, which was about a month on, why one man was dead of smallpox and six were seriously ill with it. Well, when um, Pulse recovered by the time that uh, the ship entered Boston Harbor, however, Gore, the captain, knew that he was vulnerable. He had never had smallpox and he still wasn't exhibiting any symptoms and yet he knew how contagious it was. And he also knew that if he developed the disease and went on shore, he could start a smallpox epidemic in Boston, uh, similar to the ones that had ravaged Boston in 1702 and 1703. And he didn't want to do that. Uh, when the ship was about four miles from its destination, he would soon pa pass an island called Spectacle Island. And that island is, uh, that's as it would look today with a map uh, of the Boston area. And um, in 1717, the Massachusetts Assembly had designated this site as a public quarantine hospital. And uh, any ships that were entering the harbor that knew they had smallpox on board were supposed to stop there. It wasn't always enforced and not every ship captain did because you could imagine when you stop there, you're delaying the delivery of your merchandise and your ship's owner is probably not gonna be too happy. But anyway, Gore decided that he should stop. He was feeling a little queasy, and uh, so he got, got on the island and into the hospital and noticed the disease's early symptoms, a quickened pulse, a steady climb in body temperature. By the middle of the next day, Saturday, he had intense pain in his head, stomach, and groin, and then came vomiting and chills. When he woke up the following morning, Sunday, he was feverless and feeling well, except for a slightly sore throat, and must have thought that, wow, he'd shaken this off, whatever it was. However, within a few hours, a mild rash had developed on his cheeks and uh, forehead. Then his voice went hoarse, and his throat broke out in sores that stung like paper cuts. As his throat swelled, swallowing went from excruciating to nearly impossible. Now the fever was back and climbing and the rash was growing redder and thicker 
and spreading to his arms, chest, and back. By, num by Monday, October 31st, his fever was raging and the rash had transformed into hundreds of discreet, angry pustules. Seven days later, he was dead. So you can see how horrible that sounds. Um, the thing that, the one good thing that people at the time knew, they knew that smallpox was contagious and they knew that if you survived it, you would never get it again. So what, what actually, why is it called smallpox? What's a pox? And of course, uh, that's that pus-filled pus -filled pimple uh, that we saw and it leaves uh, uh, pock marks after it heals. And why is it small? Well, actually, to dis it was called smallpox to distinguish it from the great pox. And the great pox was the original name of syphilis. Uh, the pustules on smallpox are smaller than those of the great pox. And here you can see the size of the great pox pustules. And they look pretty disgusting too. Uh, aren't we glad we live in the 21st century? So how is smallpox spread? Well, prolonged face-to-face -face contact, uh, coughing and sneezing, of course, fluid from the pustules, objects contaminated by the fluid. Uh, and I'm not quite sure of this one. I, I copied this down anyway, but I wouldn't put a lot of faith in it. Uh, not usually spread through air ducts uh, and can only be spread by humans. Now, that is an important fact that it can only be spread by humans because it turns out I'm actually getting a little ahead of myself, but that's why we were able to wipe it out because it had no animal host to live in. So the potential complications are uh, small, you know, pockmarks on the face and other parts of the body, but then blindness. Uh, at the, about at the time, smallpox was rampant. About a third of the blindness in the world was caused by smallpox. And then there were neurological problems and actually many other problems that are just too numerous to mention here. So now I want to return to Boston, and now it's the year 1721. And in the spring of that year, a British vessel, the Seahorse, arrived in Boston Harbor. And some of its crew members were experiencing the early symptoms of smallpox. They were quickly quarantined, and the townsfolk thought they were safe. However, soon others got sick and uh, an epidemic was in process. Before we talk about that epidemic, epidemic I want to introduce you to a couple of Boston's leading citizens at that time. Well, some were leading. Uh, they greatly influenced smallpox at any rate. This is Cotton Mather. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of Cotton Mather in connection with the Salem witch trials. And uh, he was the personification of Puritanism. Uh, he was a theological conservative and the master of the fire and brimstone sermon. I'm sure when you listened to him speak on a Sunday morning, you knew that you had been to church. Uh, he was a very controversial figure in Boston, not just for the uh, uh, witch trials, but other things too. He uh, had become an adherent to enlightenment science. He was very science oriented, which was kind of surprising and uh, he was interested in the latest and most exotic medical developments in Europe. Um, he had um, dispatched reports on scientific matters to the Royal Society in London, and, and uh, they eventually elected him a fellow. Uh, he was also an avid reader of anything that they produced. The second person here is a slave, and of course this is not his picture because we don't have a picture of him, by the name of Onesimus. And he was given to Cotton Mather in 1906, and uh, from the sounds of it, he and Mather beca became pretty close to each other and talked a lot. Uh, it didn't sound like the typical master-slave relationship. So before we go further now, I want to talk about the word inoculation. And um, inoculation is the practice of taking the limp, which is the pus from one of these pustules, uh, from a person that has smallpox and putting it into the arm of a person who does not, making a little uh, slit and then uh, rubbing that limp into the cut. Um, originally that term meant just smallpox. 
Today, we use inoculation to mean many things, uh, the introduction of any pathogen or antigen into a living organism. So you know now about inoculation. So in 1713, Mather read a letter that was published by the Royal Society, uh, and its writer was Emmanuel Tomoli, who was an Italian, and he discussed the, pro the practice of inoculation with smallpox, limp, uh, in order to produce a minor case of smallpox and thus convey immunity to the disease. Now this excited Mather because in his discussions with Onesimus, Onesimus had told him about such a process back in Africa. And so uh, this loaned credibility to what Onesimus had said. So now we go forward again to 1721, the uh, 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 epidemic begins and Mather realized he has a, an opportunity to test out this theory. Can he prevent people from getting smallpox through inoculation? So he gets the, all the physicians in Boston together and he explains this to them. He tells them about this article he read. He tells how it's validated by his slave Onesimus. And can you guess their reaction? <laughs> you are right. I mean, they thought he was crazy. And uh, so, Later, there was another account published by the Royal, Royal Society on another physician who would also practice uh, inoculation. So there's one doctor in the group that he talks to by the name of uh, Zebdiel Boylston. And Boylston likes the idea. He thinks there's a lot of logic and a lot of reason to do that. And uh, so he decides to, to give it a try. And he picks his own six-year-old son as one of the people to uh, inoculate. He has a slave by the name of Jack, and Jack has a son, uh, Jackie, who's two. And uh, he inoculates all three of them. Well, when the town finds out about this, they want to string him up. Uh, but even so, he uh, continues his work. But anyway, going back to after the inoculation, he watches his son with trepidation. Uh, but after being moderately ill, the boy survives. Well, actually, he was more than moderately ill, but not severely ill. Jackie also survives, and Jack has only minor symptoms. So uh, Boy, uh, Boylston continues his work, and uh, Mather continues to support him. And one day, Mather's house is bombed. Uh, now, the bomb thrown looked more like one of those in a cartoon. You know how you have a round steel ball and it has a, a fuse sticking out of it and they light the fuse, but there's powder inside? Well, when they threw the bomb through the window, the bomb, the edge of the bomb hit the window frame and pulled the fuse out of it. So it, it, it didn't actually explode, which was lucky, otherwise Cotton Mather would not have been around. And uh, there was a message a piece of paper wrapped around the bomb, and it said, Cotton Mather, you dog, damn you. I'll inoculate you with this with a pox to you. And uh, so now if that bomb had exploded, that note probably wouldn't have survived. But uh, at any rate, I guess that was in case it didn't. Uh, so anyway, the, the um, you know, almost uh, a year goes by, and uh, the smallpox plague, uh, smallpox epidemic, eventually resides. And uh, altogether, 844 people died in Boston of the, of, and 4,915 4, survived. Now, the population of Boston at the time was roughly 11,000, so that meant that there was probably about five or 6,000 people that didn't come down with it. Now, of those inoculated, you can see that uh, six died and 276 survived. So in the end, 15% of those who contracted smallpox died compared to 2% of those who were inoculated. So the, uh, <clears throat> the practice then of inoculation with smallpox virus became known as variolation because again, vario the variola virus is what causes smallpox. Uh, in Asia, practitioners had developed the technique for variolation many years ago by 1700, it had spread to Africa, India, and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and in contrast to the way 
we talk about it being done early on, they would take the scabs from people who were sick from smallpox and they would grind them up and put them like a straw in like a straw and then the people that wanted to be inoculated would snort them. Uh, that sounds like a, a worse way than putting it in your arm, but probably wouldn't hurt as much. Uh, another thing that happened there too, another person that uh, comes into play is Lady L Larry, I'm sorry, Lady Mary Worthley Montague. She was the wife of the British ambassador to Turkey, Constantinople actually, and uh, she had witnessed uh, this type of thing, variolation. So she returned to England in 1721 and, and she urged uh, the Prince of Wales, the Princess of Wales to give variolation a try. And so they found several prisoners in Newgate prison and a couple of abandoned kids and practiced inoculation on them. And uh, they all survived, they didn't get smallpox. Uh, and so they decided the, the uh, procedure was safe and a few members of the royal family underwent variolation. And the procedure then became fashionable in Europe. Now George Washington had his bit with smallpox. You may have all heard that as a young person he had contracted smallpox, which was probably a good thing for us because if he hadn't had that immunity during the Revolutionary War, he probably would have come down with it. He was 19 years old. He went with his brother Lawrence to uh, Barbados. Bar uh, Lawrence was going to Barbados because of tuberculosis and trying to find a climate where he would uh, find a, a little... Uh, little relief. And uh, while they were there, there was a family that uh, some people had smallpox and uh, they went there for dinner and with some reservation, which they should have had. Uh, he says, I should have listened to my uh, conscience because uh, I paid the price. But uh, he survived and uh, it took 24 days before he was really clear, but he did that. So he was lucky to escape with uh, his life and then few visible scars. Uh, smallpox in the Continental Army, uh, back in December 31st, 1775, a group of uh, colonial soldiers attacked the fort at Quebec, at Quebec City but they had experienced smallpox en route, and uh, so they were very weakened, and nonetheless, they, they didn't win the battle. And you know, if they'd have won that battle, that might be part of the United States today, we don't know, you know. Did I offend any Canadians here? <laughs> uh, so, and then in, uh, in January of 1777, after the Battle of Princeton, Washington decided to variolate his entire army. Now, that was a good time to do it, because for the most part, Armies didn't fight in the wintertime, because if he'd have done that in the spring of the year, he'd have had a whole bunch of sick people for a couple of weeks until they recovered from just the variolation. Well, here we go to Benjamin Justy, an English farmer. He observed that milkmaids do not contract smallpox, and he began inoculating people with smallpox limp in 1774. And are you guys asking any questions right now? Does that seem like a funny thing? Are you saying, I thought it was Edward Jenner? And you're sort of right, but he wasn't the first. The thing that uh, Jetty, uh, he, Jetty, he didn't document what he had done. He just did it to a few people, and so it didn't, the practice didn't spread. We need to talk, before we talk too much about Jenner, about cowpox, and it's a smallpox-like disease, and it's suffered by cows, and uh, they recover. Um, it's uh, now extremely rare and reported only in Western Europe. Uh, it's, um, the virus is closely related to, uh, small, to smallpox virus, and uh, it's commonly found in cattle, however, for the most part now, it's found in rodents, pre predominantly voles. And it's even been uh, occurring sometimes in cats, and it is transmissible to humans. Uh, however, if you went and got a smallpox vaccine, if you thought you'd been 
exposed, it would cover you for cowpox too. Incidentally, it's a good point to mention that uh, a smallpox vaccine is also effective against monkeypox. So here we have Edward Jenner, and he observed that milkmaids do not contract smallpox. And an opportunity presented himself. Uh, here we see uh, Blossom the Cow and Sarah Nelms, and of course these aren't the real characters. But in May of 1796, Sarah Nelms, a dairymaid, came to Dr. Jenner because she had this rash on her hands, and he realized that it was cowpox, and he had heard this thing that you could protect somebody from smallpox by uh, inoculating them with cowpox. So he realized this was his opportunity to test his theory, and uh, he decided to do it. One of the other things it mentions here is the story of milk beings being particularly pretty was probably due to the fact that they didn't ha ever contract smallpox and they weren't all pockmarked. Another thing I learned here too is the fashion uh, idea of women putting black beauty spots on their face was actually to hide a pockmark. So uh, that's how beauty spots came about. So Jenner did his, did his experiment with his gardener's eight-year-old son, James Phipps. Um, he took lint from the pustules on, one of, on Sarah's hand and he uh, made a small incision in uh, James' arm and, and inoculated him with the, uh, with the cowpox. And uh, then on the, seven, on the seventh day following the procedure, the boy complained of discomfort in his armpit. On the ninth day, became a little cold, lost his appetite, had a slight headache, and he was lethargic throughout the 11th day, but by the 12th day, he was fully recovered. So um, Jenner waited then uh, for a little while, and then on, on July 1st, he inoculated the boy with smallpox uh, in the usual way. Put a slit in his arm, got pus from a pustule and inserted it in there. And, um, Jenner and, and James never got sick. Well, he wasn't sure really that was uh, the whole thing, um, so he inoculated him 20 more times. The poor kid, you know. Uh, talk about uh, medical ethics. Uh, but at any rate, he survived all this. Well, Jen Jenner named his uh, idea vaccination. And uh, yeah, it's derived from the Latin word uh, vaccinius, which is actually pronounced in Latin vaccinus. Wac vaccinus. If any of you are Latin, correct me if I'm not quite right. But uh, at any rate, uh, so that's where we got the term vaccination. Well, at the time, the only way to practice vaccination was what they referred to as arm-to-arm -arm vaccination. So you would find somebody that you had recently vaccinated, you would take them with you over to the next town, and you would find the people there you wanted to vaccinate, and you'd take the limp out of the recently vaccinated person and infect all the other people in the town that you wanted to vaccinate. Now also, a, uh, a, a scab could also be used particles of a scab, and as a matter of fact, uh, you see this little device here, which is a, sc a scab carrier. It's about the diameter of a quarter, and uh, it exists in a museum in this country, and I forget which one now, but uh, uh, Jenner was very successful. Well, Jenner didn't enrich himself with all this, and oh, by the way, I should mention too, Jenner wasn't popular with everybody either after he started doing this, but uh, eventually was vindicated. Uh, this is Jenner's home in uh, Gloucestershire in the UK, in, in the town of Berkeley. Uh, it's a pretty big house. Uh, I, when I read that, it said he didn't enrich himself, and I see the size of this house, and, but I think I know how it happened. Uh, he had eventually worldwide recognition, and he devoted much of his time to uh, vaccination that his private practice began to suffer, and he was actually not economically well off. But his work was finally acknowledged by Parliament in 1802, and without him asking, they granted him a sum of 10,000 pounds, and then five years later, awarded him another 20,000 pounds. So you could see, he must have bought that house after he got that money. So. Uh, 
But he also, he was still ridiculed even then because people were still not necessarily believers in what he was doing. Uh, he continues at his activities and gradually uh, vaccination replaced variolation, which became prohibited in, in England in 1840. Now, Jenner did not forget about James Phipps. I'm sure we're all glad to know that. And uh, later in life, Jenner gave Phipps, his wife, and two children a free lease on a cottage in the town of Berkeley, where he was. And when James Phipps died, he was uh, buried in St. Mary's Church in Berkeley, right alongside Edward Jenner. So, uh, Well, vaccinating people in faraway places became very difficult. Uh, the, the, the lymph, if you put it into a person, it, it would probably be gone in uh, 8, 10, 12 days. So you could only go as far as you, that lymph would exist on the vaccinated person. You could get the scab carriers and you could carry the scabs and, and maybe they lasted two or three weeks, but again, uh, they also would impregnate lint or silk thread with this lymph and let it dry. And then they would reconstitute it with water when they got to where they were, wanted to vaccinate somebody. But nonetheless, it's still, they could not cross oceans with this. Well, smallpox was uh, ravishing uh, South America after the Spanish explorers uh, went there. And a Spanish surgeon, Francisco Xavier Balmas solved the problem. He had a ship called the Maria Pita, and he decided to do arm-to-arm -arm propagation all the way to South America. And he selected 22 orphan boys. These poor guys, you know, it's, we could never do this today. <laughs> so it was, if you think about that, now they would, uh, they would vaccinate, or they would, uh, yeah, vaccinate a young, boy, ever, uh, two young boys every eight days. So if you say, well, there were 11 pairs of boys, they wanted a backup in case one didn't take. Well, that gave them 88 days to get to South America, and it was about a two-month voyage, so they were able to do that. And that was actually the very first ever mass vaccination campaign. And they, they ended up vaccinating thousands of people uh, in the Americas, all the way up into uh, Texas and uh, Peru and uh, you know, all the, all the uh, Spanish territories in South America and also some of the islands. They also launched a second voyage um, with a new ship leaving on the west coast of uh, uh, Mexico with new orphans and headed for the Philippines and managed to vaccinate people in the Spanish territories there. So it was a very, very successful campaign. So in about 1860, vaccine farms began to appear. This were places where they could actually make vaccine in large quantities, and uh, they wouldn't have to use arm-to-arm -arm vaccine transfer. Uh, by 1898, uh, the practice had been banned, and that was when Park Davis began to manufacture smallpox vaccine. Now, the, just to talk about, they, they call the virus that you, that's utilized for vaccination, vaccinia virus. And its actual origin became a little murky over time because we know that uh, uh, Jenner had used the, the uh, material from the milkmaid who had contracted the cowpox from the cow. But somewhere along the way, uh, well, then they named this virus vaccinia, but then in, eight, in 1939, they discovered that it was actually different than cowpox. Uh, that it, had, it resembled horsepox uh, more than cowpox. And uh, it's speculated that maybe the cow that had the cowpox that Jenner used might have actually contracted their, their pox from a horse. And the two diseases are relatively similar. I mean, they're, they're probably the same disease. So, uh, so that was an interesting thing. So here we see making small box pox vaccine at Park Davis. And I say initially in Detroit because uh, the uh, facility out here didn't exist until 1907. But uh, the process began by picking a healthy cow. 
and they would put this cow in quarantine to make sure that it wasn't sick, keep it for several weeks. Uh, and they, then they would anesthetize the cow while they would put it into this yoke-like device where they could rotate it. So they would get the cow in there, then anesthetize it, and then strap it all in, and then they could turn the cow upside down, which you see in this view here. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty primitive. Uh, so before and after they shaved the cow's belly, they would disinfect it with strong chemicals, and then they would scarify the cow uh, at usually just maybe one centimeter, which is about a third of an inch uh, apart, and in a pattern similar to what you see here. Uh, and then they would rub the cow's belly with the seed virus, with the vaccinia virus. And then they'd get the cow out of his uh, state of uh, sleep. And uh, well, they'd rotate him around first, probably. And then they'd put him in a, put her, it was probably a female cow, into a, into a stall that was so tight that the, that the cow could not lie down because they didn't want the cow to contaminate its belly. And it was also sloped backwards so that any of the waste material didn't come forward. It went to the back of the, of the stall. And uh, in about four or five days, um, they would put the stall back in the rotating cradle and uh, euthanize it. So the cow died. And so this happened a lot, though, for the benefit of uh, mankind, uh, especially at Rochester there. So uh, once they did that, um, they would uh, use what's called a carette, which is like a scraper. It, it's almost in a way like one of those melon uh, ballers that you know that you would use to make little melon balls, and they would scrape this across the cow's stomach um, and collect this stuff, which they called vaccinia pulp, uh, and uh, uh, put it all in a container. Uh, and then they would uh, mix it in a, uh, in a uh, blender with glycerin. Uh, and actually, the pulp became a mixture of epidermal cells, plasma, hair, bacteria, and the virus. And they went through somewhat of a clarification process, but it wasn't great. I mean, those of us that got vaccinated back in the 40s probably got this vaccine. You know, it's a wonder we survived the didn't get an infection, but, uh, but we, we did make it. Uh, so there was a lot of contamination, and uh, it was the only vaccine, or the only medical substance, pretty much, that the, that the FDA allowed to be uh, administered with so much gunk in it, uh, because there was just no other way to do it at the time. So here you see uh, Park Davis, then, once they diluted down this uh, pulp and uh, ground it all up and everything, uh, they filled little thin glass tubes. And uh, these glass tubes were only like about an eighth of an inch outside diameter and had maybe like about a sixteenth of an inch inside diameter. So they, it was a very, very small amount that was in there. And then they would flame seal those glass tubes. And uh, so now you had a single uh, dose for a, an inoculation. Uh, and while this is not a Park Davis kit, they must have done something similar, but uh, this is a, a kit with uh, a, a glass tube, uh, which right here, which contains the actual virus. The, and then in the other glass tube, there's a needle that's been sterilized, and it's been sealed in this glass tube too. So that now when uh, when they go to use this uh, vaccine, this little bulb that you see here is, is open on both ends. And so they slide the bulb over the end of the glass tube. Oops, sorry about that. Over the end of the glass tube uh, until it's pretty much in the middle of the tube. And then they break off both ends. And then they slide the glass bulb or the rubber bulb up to the end of the glass tube. And when you put your finger over it and squeeze it, then you can force the little drop of uh, vaccinia out the other end there. So, uh, so that, was, that was how they would, uh, they, would, they would actually put the vaccinia on your arm, and then they would take the little needle and scratch your arm. I always thought they'd scratch your arm first and then put it on, but according to the directions that I read, and of course, 
back when I had it done, uh, I'm not sure I even, I remember it, but I don't remember the detail. Uh, but uh, used to be before you could even go to school, you had to have your smallpox vaccine. Well, today in modern viruses, modern vaccines, modern smallpox vaccine, this is the only thing it's used for, they use what's called a bifurcated needle. And uh, it's like a little tiny pitchfork down there. And um, it's sterilized, so the, the pro medical professional would remove that needle and they would dip it in a vial of vaccine. They, there's usually 100 doses to a vial. And then they would come to your arm and they would scratch your arm and at the same time they were scratching, that little drop would be going into the little incision on your arm. So it's, uh, it's gonna leave much less of a mark uh, I think we all remember, especially our parents had these ugly smallpox vaccine scars, you know. Mine, mine wasn't too bad. I can still see it though. So actually smallpox was declared eradicated in 1980. And in order to make that possible, in 1967, the World Health Organization uh, launched a, a campaign to do that. And it was probably the only time during the, those years that Russia, well, the USSR, and the United States cooperated because uh, they both supplied smallpox vaccine um, for the effort. And, uh, you know, when you think about it, I, uh, they, they had pretty much most of the world done except India. And so when you think about how in the world are you going to give everybody in India a smallpox vaccine? I mean, you know, People don't read, they don't understand. I mean, it, it, it almost looks impossible. So they, they devised what they called a ring strategy. And uh, what the ring strategy was, and of course they did this before cell phones and all the modern methods we have communicating today. So they would identify a case of smallpox in an area of India. And then the health workers would move in there with vaccine and they would vaccinate everybody within a radius of that. And so they were able to prevent that single case from spreading into more cases out around different areas. And using this strategy, they found the last human case of smallpox was in 1977 in Somalia. So it's the only disease of man that has ever been eradicated. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that it doesn't live in animals or insects was in our favor. Uh, when it came to smallpox. I actually, I probably, there's another uh, disease that got eradicated too that's an animal disease uh, called rinderpest. Uh, it's a cattle, a disease of cattle, but for the most part cattle and buffalo, but it, there must not be any other animals that uh, contract it that can spread it, so that was also eradicated. And I have talked about these character, the, here's the characteristics when you think about enabling a ratification, and that is the time between initial infection and visible symptoms uh, is relatively short, so the disease doesn't spread that rapidly right off. The, the, the symptoms are very distinctive, so you're sure you've got smallpox, and it only affects humans. Now there's two places today that we keep smallpox, the, the uh, uh, variola virus that create, that is responsible for smallpox. We do have stocks of that that are in the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, and they're also in the State Research Center of Viro Virology and Biotechnology in Kosovo, Novo, Bezirk, Oblast, Russia. If any of you know Russian, correct me. <laughs> so uh, at any rate, uh, the, there, were, there have always been plans to eventually destroy all of these, but they, they never seem to come to fruition. I think part of it is we don't trust the Russians and they don't trust us. So smallpox as a bioweapon, it actually dates back quite a long time. Uh, the uh, Spanish explorers giving contaminated items to the Indians, British Army, blankets uh, to the Indians allied with the French. Uh, they tried to uh, infect the uh, American, the uh, colonial army 
that was up on the heights there in Boston uh, during its occupation by sending some infected civilians out. That says the, oh, yeah, the Continental Army. In the 1800s, why, of course, the Indians in moving west, uh, the settlers moving west gave contaminated items to the Indians. The Confederates tr tried to sell contaminated clothing to the Union's troops. And today, numerous countries, including Russia, Iraq, Syria, North Korea, and China, have biological weapons programs. So that's really kind of scary. Um, the USSR, there's a really chilling thing there, and one of the references I gave you, you can look this up and read more about it, but uh, the Russians had a tremendous stock of smallpox uh, virus, uh, 20 tons of liquid smallpox that they had available, and they were continually manufacturing it because they couldn't keep it for any length of time. And we learned this uh, after the Soviet Union fell, and one of its, uh, uh, the person that was in charge of all this, Dr. Kenneth Alabeck, uh, left and, and told us all these things. So, uh, so it was not a, a good situation, and we can be glad that that's gone, but we don't really know. They might still have another program going somewhere else, and we certainly don't know about the Chinese, so we need to keep our guard up. But I'd still sleep at night, I wouldn't worry. You know, if, if they do anything, we won't know what it is. Uh, I had a, an, in, an incident with the Russian scientists that were actually involved in uh, making these uh, weapons of mass destruction. On February 5th, 2002, uh, I, I consulted after I left Park Davis, Rochester, and, and I consulted on the uh, construction of sterile pharmaceutical facilities. So. The United States was very concerned about all these Soviet scientists that were ex-Soviet scientists that were wandering around. So they actually enlisted them and began to pay them because they didn't want Iraq or Iran or one of these other countries to uh, put them on their payroll. And uh, as part of that, they were trying to retrain them to make vaccines. And uh, I had an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. to the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science and give a, uh, a lecture to this group of scientists. So it was uh, quite a, uh, an adventure, and I'm thinking, boy, here these people are. They were trying to kill us 15, 20 years ago, and I'm here talking to them. They brought me a real nice little uh, reindeer leather container that uh, handmade from, uh, from Russia, too, which was, which was nice. But uh, I thought I'm, one day I'm talking about making smallpox vaccine with uh, Parkdale Pharmaceuticals, and now I'm talking to the Soviet scientists. Well, smallpox threat today, certainly there is threats from bioterrorism. Um, there's always the possibility of an accidental release from a research lab, uh, in spite of all the uh, precautions that they take. Uh, and infectious materials show up from the past.